welcome to Hello World. Technology and digitalization opens possibilities for many companies to using their data to be data driven. And to use data to get insights and make decisions based upon facts, not gut feeling. Technology and digitalization also opens up the automation possibilities instead of doing things manually. Not to mention the huge upside on the impact you can have on high revenue and lower costs if you can make the data work for you. Today we will talk about real estate and the possibilities to use AI and digital twins. We have invited Nicolas Wan, who is presenting himself as a digital twin evangelist and is active on both LinkedIn, YouTube, but also as a speaker on, and speaks on different webinars. Talking about the real uh, ways real estate businesses can uh, transform, but also improve with modern technology. Hello, Nicolas. Oh, but it's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, what would you say is the incentives for a real estate company to use the data and to be data driven? Yeah, I think that's a great question, but I actually want to step back a little bit and just to say, you know, bring everyone at ease, even though it's hard to pronounce these kind of things. It's, you know, companies are ready today. You know, it's just about how can uh, you know, companies invite others to innovate with the problems or the solutions that they want to see and realizing, and this is important, that all the solutions and the systems do exist today, just maybe somewhere else. All the peoples, uh, all the people exist also somewhere in the world because we're working in a global landscape. And I think it's more about, you know, how well can companies define their problems and, you know, reduce the time for, you know, sharing that knowledge about the problems or what they want to do more of to others, to others that can help them. And I think, you know, the incentives for companies uh, when it comes to becoming data driven are exactly this, to be able to invite others to innovate with their problems. And I think you said something, Pernilla, with, you know, instead of, I think it's more complementary, as in you have the gut feeling and you also have the data to back it up hmm. or vice versa. Right. So I think it's more augmenting existing ways of working and, of course, possibly deleting or eliminating some of the things, hopefully the wasteful things that people do. Uh, so that we can reach, you know, faster time to value creation. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, the incentives becoming data driven, it's of course not to do with digital twins and AI, but actually what are the business problems? What are the jobs to be done? And, you know, and then again, realizing, you know, we have the tools and we have the people somewhere uh, and, you know, utilize that and leverage that to, you know, reach the business goals first. And like we discussed before, I mean, you know, before we started this, eight years ago when I was studying IT, IT management, we did a paper about, you know, uh, these benefits driven frameworks, all these kind of things. And the title was never call it IT when dealing with, you know, digitalization projects or anything like that, because it's always, you know, what are the jobs to be done? I think that should be the focus. Uh, but again, you know, working data driven has, you know, exponential possibilities. And I think, you know, if there are two things uh, and, and, you know, all that that I said, but there are two things that I just want to mention is that we need to make, you know, data available, uh, understood uh, in, in, the, in the end by people, but as well as systems. So have that in mind when you want to become data driven, that the data that you're, you know, you have to find out where it is, you know, where the people are, you know, managing this, all these kind of things, but the data has to be exposed at some point and in, a, in an understandable way for people as well as systems and AI. Um, and at the end, you know, the incentives are, you know, reaching the business goals much, much faster and better than what companies are doing today. Hmm. Uh, so when we speak to companies within the real estate business, they are very curious uh, and they want to know more about how to use data inside their buildings. Uh, hmm. They want to be data driven. What needs to happen to accelerate the development in the industry and uh, what needs to happen to actually make them feel a sense of emergency? I think that's a great question. I think, you know, it, it's part, you know, the data that it resides in buildings and that's very contextual, you know, is it easy 
in, in the U.S.? Where in the U.S.? Uh, what kind of real estate are we talking about here? Is it commercial? Is it critical infrastructure? Is it schools? We have to be very, very specific and more specific uh, on, you know, what actually we're talking about. That is number one. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of this sense of urgency, I think we talked a little bit about this before. Um, and I think right now, people in you know, if, if you're talking about commercial real estate, still making a lot of money, right? Uh, making a lot of money by doing the same things that they always have done. And there, that's not a problem. Uh, well, it is a problem for the planet because energy, all the buildings are, you know, energy, the energy consumption is, you know, more than any other industry, basically. Uh, so we need to do these kind of things. But I think like the sense of urgency will come because we have, you know, all these startups, we have, you know, climate crisis, rules and regulations are going to affect this. And, there's more of a demand of getting data out from buildings, not only from a risk perspective when it comes to, you know, banking and, you know, Sweden after COVID or during COVID, we see like, you know, I think like the, the world's most, you know, increase in real estate value during COVID, right? Because people, you know, they haven't, you know, bought stuff abroad and they've been hemester here in Sweden, like taking vacation at home, which had driven, you know, the prices up especially in rural areas. So I think, you know, all these kind of things, you know, sense of urgency uh, and, you know, smart homes uh, also come, you know, more to the market. You know, we have a younger generations that more demand, you know, this level of interaction that they can get from, you know, all the stuff that they're interacting with in their daily lives. It's getting there. But again, money is the driver uh, for most businesses, if we're talking about commercial real estate. And that is, you know, they're still making a lot of money. So until, you know, we're seeing that, okay, we're getting squeezed, we're not having the margins, we're having a hard time, you know, renting out the spaces, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's where the urgency is really going to come from the commercial aspects. But again, you know, from a school perspective or from critical like uh, hospitals or critical infrastructure, I think, you know, the urgency is to is already there. And I think that's more related to industry 4.0 perspectives as in increased uptime, uh, less, you know, faults and, you know, having more secure ways of working as well and actually knowing what it is that you deal with, uh, where it's, you know, but it, it'll, so yeah, that's in, in short, I can talk about this forever, but I think the, the urgency is, you know, also usually tied to money, uh, or, uh, the KPIs, the key performance, key, key performance indicators of that, you know, specific asset, whatever that is, schools, hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, indeed, but also clear, clear examples. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. But, but uh, I was thinking in, in these times with IoT and, and uh, a lot of data in the cloud, uh, we also need to talk about security uh, and yep. the risk of breaches of data uh, going out to somewhere else. And, you know, um, uh, hackers actually taking over systems that you can't really run your data. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, what, what do you think uh, the companies have to do uh, to make sure that the security levels are high? Uh, I think that's, you know, goes back to, and it's a great question. I think you know, we've seen now recently here in Sweden, you know, ransomware, you know, attacking, you know, not just, you know, personal computers, but actually, you know, computers that run, you know, grocery stores, grocery chains, where they had to, you know, pull back, we can't let anyone into the stores. And also seen that in, in Europe, and I think it was in Germany, when someone goes into a hospital actually, and can manipulate, you know, the air inside an operate, operation room. Mm. That's stuff, you know, you don't want to do, uh, you, you don't want to happen. And on my podcast, we also had one where they went into a printer, they printed out that there's a bomb in the building, and then they had to evacuate the whole building, right? Yeah, so just yeah. those small, things can lead to a lot of, you know, vulnerabilities that have, you know, detrimental effects from a city perspective. Even, yeah, right? yeah, and smart buildings. Um, I think, uh, you know, if yeah. you connect everything in your building and someone get access to that, uh, that could be a yeah. catastroph catas catastrophe <laughs> hard work. Yeah, yeah, uh, like, so, I mean, like I mean you know, with keys printers. and yeah. yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah. No, so. no, so I think like there are, there are many, so what you call like attack surfaces, there mm -hmm. are the physical ones. And of course, when you're connecting, you know, operational technology, information technology, internet mm -hmm. of things, it's, you know, it, again, like it's, it's the perfect storm, which is, you know, it's a haven for, you know, hackers, right? Hackers delight. And usually these legacy protocols are also very, very open. So I think, you know, the, the risks are 
you know, I don't, I don't even want to think about it, to be honest, especially from an infrastructure perspective when it comes to, you know, smart grid or buildings mm. and all these kind of things from a city perspective. But I think what you want to do is, again, you know, in order to think outside the box, you have to define the box. And owners, again, or whatever, you know, owners as in public or private or transactional or the ones that have long-term perspective, they're ready now, okay? Uh, they, they shouldn't be able to or they shouldn't be forced to step out of their comfort zone. They have to step into the comfort zone and be really, really well, okay, where's the data, what kind of applications do we have, and describe their reality, their operating context. That's what they're experts in, but somehow, I mean, you know, we look at, you know, LinkedIn, and we see like AI experts and digital twin experts say like, everyone should learn about IoT, everyone should learn about security, everyone should learn about all these kind of things. And I mean, I, I don't, if they, of course, if people want to, they're free to do that, but if they want, you know, urgency and change to happen fast why would they think that they can learn something that someone has spent you know 20 years yeah. of their life you know being experts in the only thing that they need to do is you know describe their reality whether that is from a building perspective but also realizing it's also the organizations so i think like i think you mentioned that before as well that we have the buildings getting data out from that one. But okay, let's say we have the smartest building so before smart building actually comes a digital building but we have let's say a smart building and then that smart building has to be, you know, managed by someone. Or is is that going to be by the, you know, the um, the assets, you know, the companies that manage assets for the owners? Is it going to be the owners themselves? Do they have the roles, the hierarchy, uh, the processes, the existing systems, the culture, and the people to get this done? Absolutely not. And then if okay, okay if they don't have that, who's going to do it? So I think it's again, it's about you know realizing, you know, what do you know most of, and you know be, you know, what to call it, masters of that domain, and then, you know, define that well enough so that you can invite others to help you. Whether that is with AI or, you know, security, it doesn't matter. And it goes back to data has to be, you know, re represented to people. So for domain experts to understand what we're actually, you know, talking about and transferring knowledge that way, but also to experts or like to systems, sorry. Because if you would run a penetration attack on a building today, uh, maybe not in Sweden, to be honest, because there, if we, if we go with this grocery store an example, you know, the, the, the grocery stores or the buildings that, you know, went well were the ones that either had, you know, no connection to the cloud whatsoever, like mm -hmm. super legacy, or the ones what at the cutting edge, which are more modular. And I think, you know, for a fact that this was because the uh, CDO of that uh, specific company had a history of, you know, running these implementations in the shipping industry. And in shipping industry, you have to be, you know, both secure, but it also has to run so-called on-premise inside the ships because it's not connected at all times, right? Mm. So I think, you know, working with, again, like the technologies exist, the people exist that can do this. It's just about, you know, defining where you are, not so much where you want to go because that's, you know, the experts know <laughs> where you need to go when you define where you are today and, you know, bridge that gap. So it's less about where you want to go and just defining where you are and then let the experts help you, you know, what are the risk levels, what are the physical attack surfaces, what kind of technologies and solutions exist uh, that we need to use, right? And it's usually not one platform. It's, you know, these modular solutions uh, that come uh, and it, it work, you know, interoperably to solve a holistic need, basically. Mm -hmm. That's, That's a long answer, but uh, it invites to innovate. That's sort of my, my, uh, my paradigm, I guess. But it's, it's a good point indeed. Like, leave it to the people that have done it before, that know what they're doing and know how to pronounce it. Yeah, absolutely. And even uh, sometimes, you know, when you're working with cutting edge stuff, you know, maybe you haven't done all of it before. Uh, having that, you know, data driven uh, and agility as a company to just say, okay, we're going to, again, have someone innovate with our building. And that does not necessarily means that someone has done it before. Because I talk to so many platform companies that say, you know, we've done this for X, Y, Z, Z, yeah. and hmm. we solved all the integration problems in the world. Okay, well, what about interoperability? And then you say, what? What is that, right? I can solve also all the integration stuff in the world, but what does that lead for, you know, innovation? One of the biggest problems with buildings today is that it's really, really hard to innovate because everything with the data is locked into either existing systems or vendors because interoperability and scalability, uh, you know, hasn't been, you know, the paradigm. And I think, you know, but I agree with you uh, to some extent. I just want to say that even though someone has done it before, 
it might actually be companies that haven't done it before, but know, you know, what could be done. And then also, you know, the, the having buildings that allow, you know, people to try out their solutions first. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also, you know, the key to start small and then do something, try it out as fast as possible, recognizing that it's the fast that it is slow mm -hmm. and then scaling that up. Uh, so not just starting with the whole portfolio, but just taking something and, you know, inviting others to work with that and then just see what works uh, both from a people perspective and a data perspective. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that brings also a very interesting next point, uh, because you've got companies who say they have done it before, but they maybe don't know the problem. But you also have companies that we often met that have a very high curiosity for yeah. digitalization, but they don't know how to get started. How yeah. hard is it actually to get started? Yeah, I, that's also like a tricky question. I mean, I, I, I recognize maybe I should be going to politics here. I can never answer a straight question, to be honest. But uh, it's it's never been this easy as it is to get started. You know, you know, you have so many IoT platforms. You can buy stuff, you know, at uh, whatever, you know, local vendor that has smart home equipment and, you know, get stuff connected to the cloud or whatever, right? But that's also a problem because where does it lead to? Uh, and so it's always, it's also haven't been this hard because there's so many choices and it's so easy to fall into traps, either, you know, vendor lock in, or you don't think about AI first, then you have to think about it, you know, second or third, which becomes a problem because then you're in the same situation that all the companies are in that started 10 years ago. Right. So I think, you know, it, it's really easy to get started. Uh, it's harder to scale. Uh, it's harder to make it interoperable. And it's really, really hard, you know, again, to get the scalability that you need and to become, you know, stay future proof when you're doing things. And I think, you know, again, having the idea of defining the reality for companies and then taking something small to get started with, that is like a type example of, you know, the portfolio that you represent or starting with something small and then inviting people. I think that's how to get started, to be honest, and allowed to be wrong, right? And you don't have to be 100% correct. Uh, so what Panilla said in the beginning, it's so like instead of doing what you do today, but actually, you know, what is the next step? How can we improve 10% of this specific problem? How can we do this 10% more of what we want to do? And just recognize that this is a stepping, you know, is a ladder that you need to climb up, define, you know, where you are today. And then, you know, companies like, you know, your company, like me or any other, you know, stress, stress, strategic company can definitely help you get started on that journey, but definitely involve experts, you know, for specific challenges because they are experts for a reason. Um, so I think it's it's easy to get started, but, you know, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, uh, but that marathon, you know, it has to happen fast as well. So it's a lot of these kind of things, uh, but I mean, uh, just get started for God's sake, just get started be wrong and just iterate and, you know, continue to do great things in the ah. future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. It's been a, a pleasure to listen to your insights uh, from the real estate business and your work that you have done and, and what you have seen. I think it's really inspiring to hear that you, you say that a digitalization project is not about digitalization at all. Uh, and it's easy to start, but hard to scale. And focus on what you do the best uh, within the real estate business and yeah. take take help to, to get uh, the action. But as you say, there are so many <laughs> ways you can go forward. Uh, yeah. But I, I like what you said to, to start small, uh, start within perhaps one building and to also focus on the different topics. I noted some down, you said the climate, it's a big issue for everybody. Mm. You also said that uh, uh, the younger audience actually requires yeah. different solutions that you, you should uh, keep in mind. Uh, but of course, the money, uh, the, what you can thrive from this. Uh, you can actually yeah. earn more money. You can hire your uh, in incomes and you can uh, lower your costs. Yeah. Absolutely. And right. It's definitely save more money, yes. create more money, and find new new ways of money. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Great. Sounds great. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Thank Bye. You. Bye. So that was Hello World for today. Thank you very much for listening, and see you next time. Bye.